In previous tutorials, we looked at how we can match two purely resistive terminations by means of uh, L-section, T-section and Pi-section matching networks. In this tutorial, we will see how the same topologies can be employed to match any two complex impedances on the Smith chart. However, there is a major difference between the case of two resistive terminations and that of two complex terminations. In the case of resistive terminations, we want our load resistance to look just like our source resistance. Both are real, and so the condition for maximum power transfer is really quite simple. In the case of two complex terminations, however, this condition becomes a little bit more complex. What we need to see from the source terminals in order to achieve maximum power transfer is an impedance that is equal to the complex conjugate of the source impedance. And this condition can be formalized mathematically by saying that ZL must be equal to ZS conjugate in order for maximum power transfer to be achieved. So we'll now look at a case when we have a uh, source impedance of 30 plus 10J and a load impedance of 57 plus 39J. And we want to design a matching network which we can put between them so that we achieve maximum power transfer. So first things first, we need to go on to project options and select our frequency of operation. We'll keep it to 1 GHz for consistency. And then we'll go on to global units and we'll select the conductance units to be millisiemens, inductance, nanoharries, capacitance, picofarads, as usual. Then we'll open a new schematic and we'll call it source impedance. And we'll use this schematic to represent the source impedance on the Smith chart. So let's just press Ctrl P to get a measurement port onto the schematic. And then, since in this exercise we are given a source impedance in this mathematical form, it is represented as a complex number in Cartesian form, we can just pull up an element called imped by pressing Ctrl L and typing imped in the search box and place it in on the schematic, which allows us, as you can see, to specify the real part, i.e. the resistive part, and the imaginary part, i.e. the reactance, of our impedance. Then we can press Ctrl G to add a ground reference and connect the port to the source impedance. Now we must set R and X to the appropriate values. Our impedance has got a resistance of 30 ohms and a reactance of 10 ohms. Now to display our source impedance on a Smith chart, all we need to do is go to graphs, open a new graph, and we'll call it complex match, and then we right click on the graph select add a new measurement and then we select the data source name to be source impedance we want to see the S11 of course and so we just click on apply and then OK then simulate now we can add a marker to our graph to see that we've got the right value we press Ctrl M and then click on the point of interest and we get a normalized reading for the impedance we can denormalize this by right clicking going on to properties and then onto the markers tab and choosing to denormalize the display to 50 ohms. Click on Apply and then OK. Now you can see that we have the correct reading. We have an impedance which is 30 plus 10 J ohms, which is just what the exercise gave us. Now, as we mentioned before, in order to achieve maximum power transfer, we need to match our load impedance to the complex conjugate of the source. So really, what we want to display on the Smith chart is the complex conjugate of this value. And this can be done really easily in microwave office by right-clicking, going on to add a new measurement, and then uh, we can uh, again get the S11 measurement, but on the complex modifier section we can specify that we want to see the conjugate of S11, which allows us to see the conjugate of the impedance as well. Click on Apply, and then OK. Then Simulate. Now you can see that the complex conjugate has been plotted on the graph, and we can see from the legend that the measurement shown by the square marker is the conjugate of S11. Now we can add another marker to this new point by pressing Ctrl M and clicking on the point. And you can see that what we're getting is 30 minus 10 J ohms, which is the complex conjugate of our source impedance. So now let's delete the marker for our source impedance and leave the conjugate of the source impedance on the chart because this is the point that we want to get to, the point that we want to transform our load impedance into. And uh, open a new schematic and we'll call it complex match. 
Then we add our measurement port, as usual. And once again, because our load impedance is specified mathematically by its Cartesian coordinates as a complex number, we can just press Ctrl L and pull up an imped element, place it on the schematic, add a ground reference, and then set the values for R and X, which are given to us by the exercise. The value for the resistance in this case is 57 ohms, and the value for the reactance is 39 ohms, giving us an overall impedance of 57 plus 39J ohms. Now connect the port to the load. And this now can allow us to see the load impedance on the Smith chart as well. So we can go back to our Smith chart, and then right-click, select Add a new measurement, and again we want the S11, but this time our source schematic will be complex match. Make sure that you don't make a mistake here. You want to make sure that you're not displaying the conjugate in this case. You must display the complex number itself that represents your load impedance. Click on Apply and then OK. Now simulate. You can see that we've got a new point added. To make it more obvious we'll press Ctrl M yet again and click on it and then we'll move the readout to a place where we can see it. And you can see that we are now uh, seeing an impedance here, which is 57 plus 39 J ohms. And this is just what we've put on our schematic, which is great. Now, to ensure maximum power transfer, what we need to do is make this point here, this impedance, this load impedance here, appear as the complex conjugate of the source, which is this point here. First of all, since we will be using elements in shunt and series, we have to modify the appearance of a Smith chart by adding admittance coordinates as well in order to be able to carry out our match more easily. So let's just right click on the chart, go on to properties, and then on the grid tab, uh, select the admittance grid to be visible, tick the values off because we don't want the chart to get too busy, and then also select the contour density to be coarse to make the chart more legible. Then go on to the Format tab and change the impedance lines to be green in colour and the admittance lines to be red. Then click on Apply and OK. Now things are a lot more visible. And uh, remember, this is our starting point and this is our target point. So how can we get from one to the other? Well, you can see there is a really obvious path here and that is going down this constant conductance circle up to the point where we meet the constant resistance circle which goes through our target point and then move up this constant resistance circle to the point that we want to get to. So because the first element that we are adding will be a shunt element we need to change our marker readout to be in terms of admittance. So let's right click on the chart, go on to properties then onto the markers tab and choose the display type to be admittance. Click on apply and then OK. So the admittance of our starting point is around uh, minus 8 millisiemens. And the admittance of our target point, which is down here, is around 16 millisiemens. Now, because we're moving down a constant conductance circle, as we've seen before, this means adding a shunt capacitor. The value of this shunt capacitor will be the one that corresponds to a susceptance, which is equal to the susceptance of my target point, which is 16 millisiemens, minus the susceptance on my starting point, which is minus 8. So the difference in susceptance between my starting point and uh, the point that I want to get to is around 24 millisiemens. This corresponds to a value for our shunt capacitor of 3.8 picofarads. So we can go back to our schematic and add a capacitor in shunt with our load resistor. and we can set its value to be 3.8 picofarads, which is what we've calculated. Then click on Simulate and go back to the graph. You can see that now we've moved exactly to the point where we want it to be, which is the point uh, which marks the intersection of the constant conductor circle, which our load impedance is on, and the constant resistance circle that takes us to our target impedance. So now we've reached our interim point by means of a shunt capacitor. What we can do is go up the circle of constant resistance here and uh, reach our target point, which is the complex conjugate of the source impedance. And moving up a constant resistance circle 
means, of course, adding a series inductor. Now, because we are going to add an element in series, we need to make our life easy and change the marker readout to impedance. We just right-click on the chart, go on to Properties, and change the display type to impedance. Click on Apply, and then OK. Now, the reactance on my starting point is around minus 40 ohms, and the reactance at my end point is around minus 10 ohms. So the difference between the two is minus 10 minus minus 40, which adds up to about 30 ohms. A value of 30 ohms for the reactance corresponds to an inductor which has got a, a value of about 4.8 nanoharries. So what we can do now is add an inductor in series of a value of 4.8 nanoharries to the network we already have and see where that takes us. So let's go back to the schematic make a little bit of space for ourselves and then fetch an inductor and insert it in the schematic like so. Then we can set its value to 4.8 nanoharries, which is what we've just calculated. Click on simulate and then go back to the graph. And you can see now that the two points pretty much overlap. They are not perfectly the same value but it's a value which is close enough to what we want to achieve. So now what the source will see will be an impedance which is equal to the complex conjugate of its own impedance and this will ensure maximum power transfer to the load. What we'll do next is to verify that our match is indeed correct and we'll set up a schematic where we have a source with a source impedance of 30 plus 10J and a load with an impedance of 57 plus 39J and we'll see that the reflection coefficient is exactly zero. So we can go back to circuit schematics and, and since I don't want to redraw the whole schematic I just need to change a little bit of it I can uh, uh, click on the schematic that I'm interested in and then drag it on the circuit schematics heading and then release the mouse and you can see that a new schematic has been created which has got the same name but has got a, an underscore one added to it so I'll just change the name of this to avoid confusion and I can do this by right-clicking and selecting Rename Schematic and I'll call it Verify Match. Now, uh, we've got our load impedance here and we'll leave this alone for now and uh, we've got our uh, matching network here. Now we want to change the impedance of our port so that it represents a source with an internal impedance of 30 plus 10 J ohms. And we can do this quite easily by just double-clicking on here and then type in 30 plus 10 times J as a value for our port impedance. Make sure that you multiply the 10 by the J with the uh, star character because otherwise things won't work. So this schematic basically comprises of a source with an internal impedance of 30 plus 10 J, a load which is 57 plus 39 J ohms, and the matching network between them which should ensure maximum power transfer and hence no power reflected back into the source. To verify this, let's go back to our Smith chart graph and then add a new measurement. Let's remove the markers so that things are not quite so busy. Let's right click on the chart and click add a new measurement. This time the schematic it comes from is verify match and then we can select uh, S11 as the measurement, click on apply and then OK. So if we've done things correctly, what we should see here is a reflection coefficient which is right in the center of the chart, which means that it's got uh, an amplitude of zero since all the power is transferred to the load. So let's just simulate. And you can see that we're pretty much in the center of the chart, which means that we've achieved our match between our source and our load. In the last part of this exercise, I would like to point out how we can uh, make these impedances which we've represented in a mathematical form a bit more real and just uh, use circuit elements to represent them. So if we go back to our schematic that we've used to verify the match, starting with the load, we can replace this impedance with a resistor and an inductor in series. So let's just get these two elements. Uh, let's get a resistor and connect it to ground and then an inductor and put it in series with the resistor connect everything together so now this series RL represents my load working out the value of the resistance is quite easy 
because it's given to us directly if we look at the Cartesian representation of our load impedance. Uh, the 57 part of it, the real part of it, represents the resistive part. So the resistor is 57 ohms. For the inductor, we need to turn our 39 ohm reactance into a value for the inductance. This can be easily done with the appropriate formulae, and it turns out to be 6.2 nanoharis in this case. So now, if I simulate again, I should get exactly the same result as I got before. So let's click on simulate and go back to the chart and you can see that we're still in the center of the chart as before. So let's go back to the schematic yet again. We've changed our load from a uh, complex impedance in mathematical form to actual circuit elements and we've replaced it with a resistor in series with an inductor. Now what about our source? At the moment we've got its impedance specified in a mathematical form. An impedance of this value represents a resistance of 30 ohms in series with an inductance whose reactance is 10 ohms. So we can work out the value of the inductor which corresponds to a reactance of 10 ohms and put it in series with a resistor of 30 ohms. To represent the resistor we can just use the port itself. So we can just set the impedance of the port to 30 ohm. Then we can put an inductor in series with it so as to uh, achieve an overall impedance of 30 plus 10 J ohms. So let's make a little bit of space for ourselves here and then insert an inductor in series with our port and assign a value to it which is the value corresponding to our reactance of 10 ohms and this turns out to be 1.6 nanoharis. So now we've got a source resistance of uh, 30 ohms plus 10 J ohms, which is represented by the inductor of 1.6 nanoharis. Then we've got a matching network, and then we've got our load impedance, which is again a series RL impedance. So now if I click on simulate, I should get exactly the same result as I did before, and see that my reflection coefficient is bang on in the center of the chart. So we've looked at the case where we had two complex impedances and uh, we've managed to devise a matching network of the uh, L-section type which allowed us to uh, carry out the match and ensure maximum power transfer between the source and the load. We could have used a, a T matching network or a pi matching network, it doesn't really matter. You can use uh, L-sections, T and pi sections to match any impedances on the Smith chart. However, now we will be looking at a different method to create a matching network, which we haven't looked at before. To do this, we'll be using two uh, complex impedances yet again, but of a slightly different value to the ones that we've just used. So we'll keep all the measurements on, uh, but I'll take away the one that comes from the verification schematic, because it'll be irrelevant, and I will also delete the verification schematic. So let's go back to our source impedance schematic and we'll change the value of our source impedance to be 10 plus 20 J ohms. So basically we've got a, a resistive part of 10 and a reactance of 20. Now let's simulate and go back to our graph. And uh, you can see that we've got a uh, value for the source impedance which is right here. And we also have the complex conjugate right there. And we'll add a marker on our complex conjugate and you can see that it is exactly what we expected it to be, which is 10 minus 20 J ohms, since our source impedance was 10 plus 20 J ohms, and this is its conjugate. Now let's go back to the complex match schematic, and we'll get rid of our matching network, which won't be applicable any longer since we're changing things around, and then we'll change the value of our load impedance to be 100 plus 50 J ohms. So the resistive part will be 100, and then the reactance will be 50 ohms. Now we connect the two together yet again, and simulate, and go back to our graph, and uh, we can see that uh, uh, our starting point is in a different location now, which is 100 plus 50 J ohms in impedance. We can verify that by pressing Ctrl M, clicking on the point, and then you can see that the marker readout gives us exactly what we want. So as before, we need to make the source C a complex conjugate of its own impedance at its terminals. So we want this current load here 
to appear as if it was this impedance here, which is the complex conjugate of the source. We could achieve this with an L-section matching or pi or t, but we'll do it differently this time. You may remember that when you have a load impedance that does not match the source impedance and you add a section or transmission line in series with the load impedance, you end up going around the Smith chart in a circle, which is centered around the center of the chart. That is because, although the modulus of the reflection coefficient is determined by your load impedance, the impedance that is at the end of the transmission line, the face of the reflection coefficient rotates around in a clockwise direction depending on the length of the stretch of transmission line which is connected to the load. So what we could do is use just that, use a stretch of transmission line which is going to make us rotate around the chart until we get to a circle of constant conductance for instance and then we can move down that circle to reach the point that we want to get to. So let's get down to business, let's go back to our schematic and then we'll press Ctrl L and fetch an element called T Lin. We've used this before. And this is a transmission line that is specified in terms of its electrical length. And uh, in order to specify it uh, in terms of electrical length, we have to specify which frequency we're working at, which is F note. And in our case, it's 1000 megahertz, i.e. 1 gigahertz. Now, to work out the length of the line that we need, to get to whichever circle we want to get to, we just double click on this element and then select its initial length to be zero, so it's just as if there was no line. Then we tick the box that enable us to tune it and then we select a uh, lower and upper limit as well as a step. So we'll say that we go between zero and 180 degrees which allows us to go all the way around the chart in a step of one degree and make sure that you also click on the limit box which enables this limit that you just set. So let's just click on that and we get a tick then click on OK. So now we've added a stretch of transmission line and this transmission line will rotate us clockwise around the chart to different points depending on its length. We've seen this in a previous tutorial and uh, we want it to be of the correct length to take us to the interim point that we want to get to and we'll be able to do that with a tuner. So just click on simulate, go back to your graph and now as you can see nothing has changed because our transmission line length is set to zero. But now if we open the tuner you can see that uh, the limits have already been set because we specify them in the element properties and you can go between 0 and 180 in increments of 1. Now before I start uh, tuning the length of the line I need to change the marker readout to something that will help me work out directly what angle I have gone around the circle to reach my interim point. And this can be done quite easily in Microwave Office by changing the display type of the marker. We just go to uh, Properties again and then on the Markers tab you can decide to display the reflection coefficient in terms of magnitude and angle. And this way, as you travel along the chart, you will see uh, how far an angle you've traveled. Click on apply and then OK. So the angle that you're starting from is 26.6 degrees roughly and now as you increase the electrical length of your transmission line you will go around a circle of constant radius centered around the chart until you reach a point on the constant conductance circle where your target point lies. So let's just start increasing this and we start going around the circle and then we get to the point where we meet the constant conductance circle. So the angle that we started from was about 26.6 degrees. The angle that we got to is roughly 117.4 degrees. So the difference between your starting point and your end point is roughly 144 degrees. Now remember that what you've got plotted on the chart is the reflection coefficient and the reflection coefficient measures reflections. So if the transmission line between the, your measurement point and the load has an electrical length of alpha degrees, by the time the incident signal reaches the load, gets reflected back and comes back to the measurement point, it will have traveled twice that length, so 2 alpha, and you can see on our Smith chart 
then we've travelled an angle of about 144 degrees. But when you look at the tuner, you can see that the electrical length of the transmission line that got us to travel 144 degrees is around 72 degrees. So it is very important to remember this, that when you go around a certain angle on the Smith chart, you need to halve that value to work out the electrical length of the transmission line that allows you to travel that distance. Now, I've got to a circle of constant conductance and now I can move down this circle to get to the complex conjugate impedance of the source, which is the point that I ultimately want to get to. So all we need to do is add the right amount of susceptance to be able to move down the constant conductance circle and reach our target point. Moving down the constant conductance circle means adding a shunt capacitor. And all we need to do is work out the different susceptance between our interim point and our target point so that we can work out the right value of the capacitor. Now, to do this, let's right-click on the chart, go on to Properties and change the readout to Admittance and turn it back to Real and Imaginary. And then click on Apply and OK. Now you can see that the susceptance at your uh, target point is 40 millisiemens. The susceptance of your uh, interim point is 20 millisiemens. The difference between the two is 20 millisiemens, which is a positive value and hence corresponds to a shunt capacitor. And then we can work out the value of this capacitor, which turns out to be 3.2 picofarads. So if we go back to our schematic, close the tuner, and then insert a capacitor in shunt with our transmission line, and give it a value of 3.2 picofarads, then simulate we can see that we've achieved our match and now the impedance seen by the source is the complex conjugate of its own impedance. Now let's remove these markers and uh, go back to our schematic list and we can do exactly the same thing as we did before to verify that we've got the right thing. Let's drag our complex match schematic on the circuit schematic heading. A copy is created and we'll rename this verify match as we did before. First of all, we'll change the impedance of our source to 10 plus 20 J ohms so that we can verify that the reflection coefficient when we've got this matching network in is actually zero. Let's make a little bit of space here so we can see things clearly. So now we've got a source with an impedance of 10 plus 20 J ohms and uh, if we represent the reflection coefficient seen by this port we should see that it is zero so it is exactly in the center of the chart. So let's go back to our graph, right click, add a new measurement, this time it will come from Verify Match. We want the S11, click on Apply and then OK, then Simulate. And you can see that we're bang on in the middle of the chart, which means that the magnitude of our reflection coefficient is zero and hence we've achieved maximum power transfer to the load. Let's go back to our schematic, as we did before, we'll now replace the mathematical elements that we've got with actual circuit elements, a complex impedance of 100 plus 50 J ohm corresponds to a series RL where the resistive part is obviously 100 ohms and our inductor will have a value which corresponds to our reactance of 50 ohms and this turns out to be 8 nanoharries. So if we just click on simulate and go back to our graph we are still in the same point on the chart. Finally, uh, we'll make a little bit of space for ourselves here and uh, we'll uh, represent our source impedance by a port with a resistance of 10 ohms in series with an inductor which has got a value that corresponds to a reactance of 20 ohms and this turns out to be 3.2 nanoharries. Now if we simulate and take a look at the graph yet again we can see that we're still in the middle of the chart.